welcome uh, to the Fort Hall Forum at Suffolk University in Old South Meeting House. Uh, tonight's program is presented in collaboration with Old South Meeting House as part of the museum's Partners in Public Dialogue program. These two institutions, the Fort Hall Forum and Old South Meeting House, share a really long history dating back to the early years of the open forum movement. Today we share a commitment to the freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. We invite you to learn more about Old South Meeting House at the info table in the back there. Uh, I'm Jen Bernardi, I'm the executive director of the Fort Hall Forum at Suffolk University. Uh, and I'm happy to see uh, the interest we got in tonight's topic, the state of human rights. Uh, I'd first like to thank uh, Old South Meeting House uh, and Suffolk University's Model UN for partnering uh, with us to bring you this discussion tonight. Uh, Fort Hall Forum also thanks our generous sponsors, including, among others, the Lowell Institute, uh, the Barr Foundation, the Nellie May Education Foundation, uh, our partners at Suffolk University, and the Massachusetts Cultural Council. We also encourage you to visit our new restaurant sponsor, the Woodward Restaurant, and that's part of the Ames Hotel just down the street. I put a little map on your program booklet just for you. And finally, the Fort Hall Forum, of course, thanks our members, without whom we wouldn't, uh, we'd never be able to put on these free public events. If you're not a member of the Fort Hall Forum yet, please go to the uh, info booth just in the back, uh, and you can sign up tonight. Tonight's forum is a Frederick G. Cornell Memorial Forum, named for one of the Fort Hall Forum's biggest advocates and an avid former board member. Human rights were of great interest to Frederick Cornell, and I believe that he would have been eager to participate in tonight's uh, conversation were he still here with us. Here to say just a few words about the late Frederick Cornell is his daughter, Katie. Come on up, Katie. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Jen. You really kind of said it all for me. We were discussing what to say on the way in. I just wanted to recognize my mother and my father's sister, Agnes, here. And uh, we were saying on the way in that uh, it's difficult to put into words uh, what a special person my father actually was. But it is true that he dedicated much of his time and effort to the Fort Hall Forum because he really did believe that free speech is an important right to protect. And I agree with what you said, that he would have very much been interested and appreciated this program. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you all have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. Uh, before we hear our opening statements on human rights from each of our esteemed speakers, allow me to introduce our discussion moderator, Dr. Jasmine Waddell. Dr. Jasmine Waddell is an American and British trained comparative institutionalist scholar who studies social vulnerability, social exclusion, and poverty in the U.S. and the Global South. In addition to her traditional academic work, Waddell served as the Senior Officer for Research and Learning at Oxfam America. At Oxfam, she managed ma major research reports on social vulnerability to climate change, black-brown alliance building, measuring human development, and post-Katrina recovery. A Rhodes Scholar, Waddell assessed the implementation of social welfare policy in South Africa during apartheid. Please join me in wa welcoming Dr. Jasmine Waddell. Okay, I'm a little bit shorter than Jen, so can you hear me? Okay. Um, thanks so much. Um, this Fort Hall forums are always so wonderful, um, and uh, you know I appreciate uh, so much uh, the support. And I'm really excited to be introducing our two uh, our two uh, 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 discussants today. So first, I'm going to talk um, uh, about uh, Reverend Dr. William Schultz. And then he's going to stand up and speak, and then I'm going to introduce John Cerrone. So Reverend Dr. Um, William Schultz is the president and CEO of UUSC, the Universalist, uh, uh, the Unitarian Universalist Service Commission, uh, Committee, a non-sectarian organization that advances human rights and social justice in the United States and around the world. Previously, he served for 12 years as executive director of Amnesty International USA. 
An ordained Unitarian Universalist minister, Schultz is a former president of the Unitarian Universalist Association. He has appeared frequently on radio and television news uh, and analysis shows, and he is the author or contributing editor of seven books, including In Our Own Best Interest, How Defending Human Rights Benefit Benefits Us All, Tainted Legacy, 9-11, and The Ruin of Human Rights, the, phenomena, the Phenomenon of Torture and the Future of Human Rights, U.S. Policy for a New Era. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Reverend Dr. Schultz. Dr. Waddell, thank you and good evening to all of you. Uh, two weeks ago, I preached a sermon in the church where I was ordained to the ministry 37 years ago this November. And I was reminded that what Cardinal John Patrick Foley's mother said of him might well be said of me. Uh, Cardinal Foley grew up in Connecticut, but he was for many years the chief spokesperson for the Vatican, and he was a connoisseur of Italian food. And when he returned to the United States after several years in Rome, his mother took one look at him, and she said, John, there were 20 pounds of you that were not ordained. <laughs> well, it's not just my girth that has changed in the last 37 years. The world itself, and particularly the human rights world, have undergone an enormous transformation. Consider this. In 1975, about a third of the countries in the world were democratic. Today, close to 60% are at least putative democracies. In 1975, there were 19 women in the United States Congress. Today, there are 98, still too few, but 98. In 1975, the vast majority of the countries in the world practiced the death penalty. Today, a shrinking minority does. In 1975, there was no international mechanism to bring to justice any of the world's great tyrants. A month ago, the International Criminal Court convicted its first defendant. In 1975, Nelson Mandela was in prison. The Soviet Empire appeared to be impregnable. No one had heard of Aung San Suu Kyi, and the internet, a key vehicle for human rights success, was not even a gleam in a technological eye. Well, I mention all this simply to underscore the enormous progress that's been made in human rights over the past four decades. And I want to mention four challenges that face us today, but because of that progress, I'm also going to mention four signs of hope for the future. 30 seconds on each of them. The first challenge is to the ideological basis of human rights themselves. Elie Wiesel called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights the sacred text of a worldwide secular religion. The Western tradition in which human rights have been nurtured has tended to reject sectarianism, and champion pluralism, both religious and otherwise. But now comes a Muslim world newly emboldened to claim a democratic mantle, but most Muslim states recognize little distinction between sacred and secular, between mosque and state. Does that mean that Islamic states, by definition, cannot be human rights respecting states? Of course. But what might it also mean that the secularity traditionally associated with human rights may require modification? A second challenge, China. Not only because in sheer numerical terms, China commits more human rights violations than any other country with, for example, 100,000 people in prison without fair trials, four to 5,000 people executed each year, often for petty crimes, not only is China important to human rights because of that, but because of its enormous reach and influence. A successful capitalist country that defies democratic norms was thought to be impossible. But China not only flouts its repressive system, it protects allied criminal regimes from international sanction, most notably in Sudan and Syria. A third challenge the continuing proliferation of category crimes, such as violence against women, 
and against LGBT persons and against persons of color as we've seen recently in the Trayvon Martin case. Women continue to be subjected to dowry killings in the Asian subcontinent. Female genital mutilation is still widespread in Africa and the Middle East. And women continue to be the first victims of economic exploitation, including in this country. Restaurant workers, for example, in this country, predominantly women, earn an average of $2.13 an hour. A final challenge, the growing intersection between human rights and other global challenges, particularly population growth and climate change. It's not a coincidence, not a coincidence that Rwanda had the highest population density of any country in Africa at the time of the 1994 genocide. It's not a coincidence that desertification, the encroachment of the desert in Sudan, contributed to the conflict in Darfur between pastoralists, farmers, who sought to restrict access to their drought-stricken lands, and herders, herders of animals who had become more and more desperate to gain access to those same lands. Any human rights activist who is not at the same time an environmental activist is fighting only half the battle. But the news is not all bad by any means. Four reasons for hope. The first reason for hope has been the explosion in the number of human rights groups that exist around the world. A recent study for the U.S. Holocaust Museum identified 115 organizations working on genocide prevention alone. And the 12 major ones were all founded in the past five to seven years. Virtually every country, even some of the most repressive, like Belarus or Cambodia or Syria, can now boast indigenous human rights groups, including women's rights, and gay and lesbian rights groups, which track violations, report abuses, hold their governments to account. Secondly, those burgeoning groups no longer must rely on 20th century techniques alone to carry on the good fight. We all know about Twitter-organized protests and viral YouTube videos such as Coney 2012, which multiply the impact of activists who may initially be modest in number, but that is but the tip of the iceberg. Satellite imaging, for example, satellite imaging has identified slave labor camps in North Korea. It has offered protection to villages at risk of massacre in Darfur, Sudan. Integrated text messaging systems expose fraudulent elections. They provide banking services to remote regions and they hold corrupt officials to account. The second reason for hope is that new technologies are transforming the human rights struggle. And the third reason is because some old techniques are bearing newfound fruit. Economic sanctions appear to have helped convince Burma to steer a new course. Military intervention in Libya, as in Kosovo before it, has thus far on balance, done more good than harm. The sheer threat of indictment, the sheer threat of indictment by the International Criminal Court has contributed to a resolution of crises in Guinea and in Côte d'Ivoire. Regional organizations in Africa have at least occasionally found their voices in support of democracy and human rights, most recently in Mali. And the final reason for hope is that social and economic rights, which are a major focus of my own organization, the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, about which you can read more at the table in the back, economic and social rights, the rights to a decent standard of living, for example, which have long been the stepchildren to traditional civil and political rights, are finally finding their day in the sun. A very quick brief overview. Robert Frost said that poems, poems begin, he said, poems begin with a lump in the throat. And human rights do too, with a sickening of the heart at the sight of misery. And I think that the human rights future is bright as long as all of us remember how fragile we are, all of us remember 
the fragility that we human beings share. Thank you. Wow, I'm excited to see what's next. <laughs> um, thank you so much, um, Reverend Dr. Schultz. So our next speaker uh, is Dr. John Cerrone. John is a professor of law and the director uh, of the Center of International Law and Policy at the New England Law School. Before joining the New England Law Faculty in 2004, Cerrone was executive director of the War Crimes Research Office at American University Washington College of Law, where he served as a legal advisor to various international uh, criminal courts and tribunals. As a practicing international lawyer, Cerrone has worked for a number of different intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations, including the United Nations, the International Secretariat of Amnesty International, and the International Crisis Group. He has extensive field experience in conflict and post-conflict environments such as Afghanistan, Kosovo, Sierra Leone, and East Timor. Cerrone is a U.S. member of the International Law Association's uh, International Human Rights Law Committee and is accredited by the United Nations to repre represent the American Society of International Law before various UN bodies. He is an elected member of the International Institute of Humanitarian Law. So uh, I very much welcome uh, Dr. Cerrone. Thank you so much. Okay, I now need to lower expectations a little bit. I'm a law professor, so this is necessarily going to be a little more technical and a little more dry than my co-panelist presentation. But I thought I'd say a few words about developments in the realm of the responsibility to protect and talk about how that doctrine was, well, how it played out in the context of the upheaval in the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa over the past year, and in Libya in particular. I hope I don't need this now. <laughs> um, so what is the responsibility to protect? In order to appreciate the significance of this political doctrine that was adopted by the international community at the World Summit of 2005, it's important to remember the traditional structure of the international legal system. Traditionally, the international legal system was not friendly towards the notion of human rights. The system is based on the sovereignty of states. What states did internally toward their own people was nobody else's business. This is embodied in the principle of non-intervention, which was a foundation principle of the system and still remains a very important principle in international law. So when we look at the, the gains of international human rights over the past 60 or 70 years, we have to remember the starting point. Because I know my students always look at the human rights systems today and say, wow, they're such weak, fragile institutions. And you know, if you compare them to domestic enforcement bodies and courts, the international system does, fe does seem to be pretty weak. But prior to World War II, International law prohibited states from even protesting over the way other states treated their own people. To protest even the most serious human rights violations committed internally by a government against its own people was considered an encroachment on that state's sovereignty. So bear in mind this background so you can understand what an uphill battle it was for international law to recognize the concept of human rights and that there are limits on the way a state can treat its own people. This is clearly embodied, the, the culmination of these developments, in the adoption of this responsibility to protect uh, doctrine in 2005. I'm just going to read a few brief lines from the statement, the outcome document of the World Summit, because this embodies that doctrine. The responsibility to protect populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. Each individual state has the responsibility to protect its populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. It places the primary responsibility on each individual state to protect its own population. So here already, we see that the international community is beginning to recognize that states do not have an entirely free hand in the way they treat their own people. There is a responsibility on states to protect their own people. Should that state fail, there is then a responsibility on the international community to do something. 
The international community through the United Nations also has the responsibility to use appropriate diplomatic, humanitarian, and other peaceful means in accordance with chapters six and eight of the charter to help protect populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. In other words, all of the members of the international community have a responsibility to do something if these crimes are being committed within a state. It's not just the responsibility of that state. Other states have a responsibility to do something. And clearly, a broad range of measures is envisioned. This part of the responsibility to protect doctrine does not contemplate the use of armed force because it's referring to chapters six and eight of the Charter. Those chapters of the UN Charter do not contemplate coercive measures. However, the doctrine continues. The international community is prepared to take collective action in a timely and decisive manner through the Security Council in accordance with the Charter, including Chapter 7, Chapter 7 being the enforcement power of the Security Council, so here we're getting to coercive measures, should peaceful means be inadequate and national authorities are manifestly failing to protect their populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. So here, we're going all the way to coercive measures. If states manifestly fail to protect their populations from these crimes, the international community is making a commitment here to use the resources at the disposal of the United Nations to intervene forcefully within that territory. Now, this is not affecting a change on the legal framework. It's a political commitment. The legal framework for the use of armed force remains the same. It's generally prohibited, subject to two exceptions, self-defense and Security Council authorization. What they're referring to here is the possibility of Security Council authorization, that the Security Council would authorize the use of armed force in order to compel a state to comply with the Security Council's edict, and in particular, to cease violating, uh, to, to cease commission of international crimes. As you know, or as you may know, this was activated in the Libya context. But the Libya context also demonstrates a range of other measures that are now part of the toolbox of the international community. And this, I think, is one of the most important developments in the responsibility to protect context. It was not just the use of armed force, ultimately through the Security Council, but a range of other measures were employed, some of them measures that have been newly created. So, for example, the first body to act in response to the situation in Libya was the UN Human Rights Council. The UN Human Rights Council was newly established in 2006 to replace the Commission on Human Rights, the former human rights charter body of the United Nations, which, had seen to become, which was seen to become ineffective. The Human Rights Council activated its power to convene special sessions. This was a major reform in uh, the Commission becoming the Human Rights Council. Now, the Human Rights Council of the United Nations is a political body. The members of the Council are states, so it's an intergovernmental body. The people sitting in the room are representing governments. They're not independent experts. One of the advances in going from commission to council was lowering the threshold for convening special sessions. So on February 25th of last year, the Human Rights Council convened a special session on Libya and launched a commission of inquiry to conduct fact-finding and report back to the council on whether and to what extent violations of human rights law and humanitarian law were occurring in the territory of Libya. The Council also recommended to its, parents, to its parent body, the UN General Assembly, to suspend Libya's rights of participation in the Council, another sanction on the Libyan regime. It's, a, it's noteworthy that at the time this special session was convened, Libya was in fact a member of the Human Rights Council. Libya had previously been elected to the Council and was serving as a member of the Council when the special session was convened. And even more interestingly, the Libyan ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva spoke in favor of convening the special session and also spoke in favor of sanctioning Libya. The Libyan ambassador in Geneva had already changed allegiances, but the Libyan government in Tripoli had failed to withdraw his credentials. So we saw in Geneva the Libyan ambassador speaking in favor of condemning the Libyan government. The next day, there was an emergency meeting of the Security Council. 
During that meeting, the Security Council adopted Resolution 1970, employing a number, a number of other measures to respond to the Libyan situation, including an arms embargo, targeted sanctions like a travel ban and an asset freeze, and significantly, a referral of the situation to the International Criminal Court. This is a relatively new tool in the toolbox of the international community. It's also historic because it was the first time the UN Security Council unanimously referred a situation to the International Criminal Court. There had only been one ICC referral, only one referral to the court up until this point in time, and that was with respect to the situation in Darfur. The Darfur referral was not unanimous. There were two abstentions, China and the United States. And I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna quickly just hit on some of the other measures that were employed by the international community. The Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC opened an investigation. It requested arrest warrants, which were subsequently issued by the court. Meanwhile, the Arab League meeting in Cairo called upon the Security Council to activate its Chapter 7 power. So this is in mid-March. The Arab League's declaration was not legally binding, but it was politically very important. For the Security Council to respond with coercive measures, there was a need to show that the region was calling for this response and that it wasn't sort of Western imperialism imposing this response on the region. If you'll note, the Security Council resolution that was subsequently adopted authorizing the use of armed force provided a very broad, robust mandate for the coalition of states that then began the armed intervention in late March. Subsequently, allegations were made by other members of the Security Council that there was overreach by the coalition. The coalition later was followed up by NATO and that their use of armed force went beyond the Security Council mandate that was authorized in Resolution 1973. Some of the fallout from that overreach can be seen in the meetings on Syria held in the Security Council last fall. As you may know, the resolutions on, secu uh, the resolutions on Syria have been vetoed by Russia and China. Russia and China accusing the Western countries of overreach in their implementation of the Security Council mandate. Um, just a few lessons from this experience. First, there is a broad range of measures available. There's an expanding toolbox for responding to internal human rights abuses and increased willingness on the part of the international community to use the tools in that toolbox. This experience also underscores the political nature of the responsibility to protect doctrine. The political stars aligned with respect to Libya, they have not aligned with respect to Syria. It is not a legal obligation to intervene, it is a political commitment, and that of course will turn on the interests of states. The danger of overreach, of course, the overreach by NATO resulted in a backlash by states that were concerned with uh, reaffirming, at least to some extent, the principle of non-intervention. And finally, the lesson of Libya is the importance of follow-up measures. There are serious human rights concerns currently in Libya under the new Libyan government, particularly in the area of women's rights and also uh, deprivations of liberty and treatment of detainees under those conditions. I'm going to wrap it up here and then I'm happy to entertain questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Cerrone. So now is the most exciting part of this program, your questions to them. Um, and so there's absolutely uh, no sensor. I see people are already starting to line up. If everybody could come up to the mic, that would be great. Um, and I look forward to your questions. I want to direct my questions mainly to Reverend Schultz. You touched on the matter of Trayvon Martin as an example of some kind of human rights violation or injustice uh, this is not in keeping with uh, an objective viewpoint in waiting till the evidence is in. So unless you know something no, no one else knows, why don't you just say, uh, withhold your judgment and not categorize this as a, some kind of a major violation of human rights. On the matter of capital punishment, you, you want to lump us in with these horrible regimes like China and the Arab countries who execute but to do so is not to acknowledge that there's no due process in those countries. Capital punishment as practiced here is okay to, to, to many of us. A majority of Americans think capital punishment is okay, regardless of your antipathy towards it. Now on the matter of your previous affiliation with Amnesty International, a defender of abortion, I assume you are also a defender of abortion, I want to focus on 
sex selection abortion, which is taking place in se several Asian countries, China being one of them. There is now evidence that immigrants from some of these countries are practicing sex selection abortion in this country. Sex selection abortion happens to be something which female babies are disproportionately uh, eliminated because they are less desired, less desired than boys in these countries. Professor Schultz, does sex selection abortion qualify as a human rights violation in your book? We've had conversations before, haven't we? Nice to see you again. Uh, of course, I don't approve of sex selection abortion. So let's just be quite clear about that. You and I disagree about the death penalty. It's true. You're absolutely right that we have due process. The fact that we have due process in this country doesn't mean that the end result of the due process doesn't also violate international human rights standards. Now, you and I disagree about this, but the, but the fact is that the death penalty is a violation of international human rights standards. And therefore, to the extent to which the United States practices the death penalty as one of the alternative punishments available, it is itself in violation of international human rights standards. Thank you for your question. <laughs> Can I respond? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, when you say international human rights standards, do you mean sort of ethical standards of the No, no, no. Or? I mean the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. I mean interpretations mm -hmm. of international standards by the European Court. Mm -hmm. In general, the death penalty, I realize there is some controversy about it, but in general, the death penalty is regarded as a violation of international standards, certainly by all major international human rights groups. Sure. I mean, I, 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 would, I think most human rights NGOs advocate that. Remember, I said standards. Right, okay. And, and so so if, if you're saying um, the current state of international human rights law, I would have to disagree. My assessment of the, current state of, of the current state of international human rights law is that the death penalty is not prohibited except by specific treaty regimes that are binding, for example, the European Convention on Human Rights. If you're a party to that and you're a party to the protocols, it's, it's clearly abolished throughout Europe. The American Convention also has a protocol abolishing the death penalty. Well, those are the two of the major oh, absolutely. standards. The, and the Covenant standards on standards. Civil and Political Rights also has a protocol abolishing the death penalty, but the U.S. is not a party to it. That's true. So there are treaty obligations to abolish a death penalty, but they're not binding on the U.S. I didn't say they were binding. Oh, okay. I said that the U.S. Remember, I was very careful in my sure, language. Sure, I sure. said international human rights standards. You've just cited three of the most important documents mm -hmm. that, that influence the, the establishment of y international human rights standards. It is certainly true, you're quite right, right, the United States always takes reservations to international treaties, including certainly around the issue of the death penalty. Again, I don't believe that that exempts the United States from those international standards any more than our uh, violations of uh, due process rights uh, at Guantanamo Bay or anyone el or anywhere else uh, justify that. Yeah, it's certainly inconsistent with the overall trend. I was just speaking sort of technically as a matter of law. Fair it's enough. not in breach Fair of international law for that <laughs> issue. <laughs> there are some other issues. Good evening. Uh, I think rather than a question, I uh, really like to speak for a moment about what we're all talking about and echo both the panelists, the moderator, and the previous speaker. Um, and uh, for myself, I, I'm primarily here because of my um, dedication to the First Amendment, to freedom of speech, freedom to write, civil rights, human rights, along with everyone else here, I believe. But it was interesting for me that uh, the doctor spoke about a cardinal from Connecticut. And after you mentioned that, I was thinking, because I was walking through the hall earlier, about not a cardinal from Connecticut, but a Catholic, a writer, a playwright, named Eugene O'Neill, who uh, had his uh, play banned in Boston. And in 1929, that was the beginning of the opening of this forum to anyone for any issue. And I was just thinking of that after you mentioned the Cardinals. That's interesting. And also, uh, the photograph back there of Dorothy Day, the co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, who spoke here. Um, Catholic Worker Movement is primarily in the United States, serving the poor serving anyone, but it's also international. Um, 
personally, uh, I oppose the death penalty as an American, as a Catholic. Um, that's my position. Many people do. I really don't want to discuss that at length, but um, the recent shooting by a handgun of a 17-year-old teenager in Florida by an adult man is uh, certainly, to my way of thinking, a violation of civil rights and human rights. And um, I think it's on the minds of many Americans, and uh, my recent reading shows me that it will be adjudicated in court, and the separate issue about the stand your ground law may be taken up too. But I think what I would uh, prefer to do rather than question you is uh, close with a statement and kind of make it international in a way uh, on civil rights, human rights. You quoted Robert Frost, so I think um, I think I'll uh, quote Seamus Heaney, uh, distant relative, a great teacher of mine. Uh, many years ago, he wrote a piece uh, about um, a poem or a play not being able to right a wrong. And later in the piece, it goes on to say, but sometimes history and hope will rhyme. And uh, f former President Clinton visited Ireland and wrote out that piece for President Clinton. And that was all related to uh, the peace process in Ireland and the violence there. So I'm grateful to be here and to speak for the First Amendment, for the right of all Americans to speak, to write. And, and I, call, I, I call myself, my attention back to those early Americans, nominal Catholics, Eugene O'Neill, Dorothy Day, who spoke up for the human and civil rights of others. Thank you. Well, thank you for... Uh for reminding us of all of that. And uh, I will say that the day before, or several days before the 2008 election, I was in Geneva speaking to the World Congress of Parliamentarians. When I was at Amnesty International, as you can imagine, I was rather critical of the Bush administration and its uh, policies with regard to the so-called war on terror. And uh, at this Congress in Geneva, a number of delegates uh, attacked uh, the United States and uh, attacked me and expected me to defend President Bush's policies. And in reply, I said to them, uh, you've picked the wrong American to defend President Bush's policies. No one has been more outspoken than I. But I will say this to you, sir, from Singapore, and to you, sir, from Belarus, and to you, madam, from Syria, that if you had been even remotely as outspoken against your president or your prime minister as I have been against mine, you would not be here today. And I think that uh, mm. I honor your uh, celebration of the uh, Bill of Rights, of the freedom of speech, uh, and the liberty that we have in this country, which allows us to disagree with one another and with our elected leaders. Can I comment on yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. I can just comment on that as well. Um, not to feel that I have to consistently disagree with you. <laughs> this, 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 is a, this is a conversation. No, I, I certainly the freedom of expression uh, is to be celebrated. And the fact that the U.S. gives uh, a great latitude when it comes to freedom of speech. But there have been some disturbing trends against free speech in the United States. And, um, you know, the U.S. tends to go around the world saying, the, talking about the importance of freedom of speech and freedom of expression and criticizing other countries. And certainly in the whole Danish cartoon controversy, uh, the U.S. came down very clearly on the side of freedom of expression, at least in the beginning, um, rejecting sort of the, the criminalization of hate speech that you find in most of Europe. And what really struck me was the Supreme Court's decision the year before last in Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project. It was an interpretation of the federal crime of material support to terrorist organizations. And that statute was given a very broad construction to include any teaching, advice, assistance to a designated foreign terrorist organization. That would be a federal crime. So teaching, advising, and um, the the, the test case was actually training one of these organizations in peaceful dispute resolution, teaching Hamas, for example, the PKK, how to use the UN human rights system rather than having armed conflict, but to try a mode of peaceful dispute resolution to resolve political differences. 
And the Supreme Court held that was, in fact, the crime of material support of terrorism, carrying a sentence of up to 30 years in prison, and that a criminal prosecution for that act of teaching or training would not violate the First Amendment. And that was shocking, because this is actually one area where international human rights law would provide more protection for freedom of expression, because there's a contextual analysis. If the context is you're training an organization in peaceful dispute resolution, that would certainly be protected speech, even though, according to the US Supreme Court, that speech can be criminalized and subject to a very heavy penalty. Uh, gentlemen, um, I come from an unusual position in the sense that I represent an uphill organization. Uh, uphill in the sense that, I, that I'm promoting the, the uh, memory, the remembrance, uh, knowledge about a forgotten genocide. I'm the president of the uh, Ukrainian Congress Committee's uh, Committee uh, for the commemoration of the genocide of 1932-33, a deliberate starvation of over five million Ukrainians by the uh, then Bolshevik government. Whenever I mention this, of course, everyone gives me a blank stare. You know, I'm, sometimes my father used to tell me that people don't never heard of Ukraine, let alone the Ukrainian genocide. You know, likewise, the non-intervention, the policy of non-intervention that you mentioned, allowed this genocide to go on. Another example, very briefly, is the Armenian genocide. You recall, as a matter of fact, um, Reverend, that Reverend Doctor that our uh, ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, Henry Morgenthau, begged, pleaded, urged Roosevelt to please do something. Non-intervention, the policy of non-intervention allowed the murder of millions of Armenians. The concern that I have is that you present a picture of the wonderful work that was done in the past 37 years. There's no question about it. I did a book review, by the way, I'm also a professor of civil rights and civil liberties over at Salem State College. I did a book review uh, in 1997 relative to the uh, tribunal at The Hague. Mm -hmm. That book came to a conclusion that nothing was happening. It was a hollow, empty tribunal. Mm -hmm. Changes have taken place. Progress has been made. But I do have to ask you this. You've, you've given a rosy picture of the progress but a lot more has to be done. Public recognition is the answer. And what I'd like to get, uh, perhaps in the form of a question, uh, let me rephrase it in the form of a question. What do you see, where, what, who else are we missing, who else are we forgetting, and what can we do about it so that Ukraine, Armenia, Darfur, which by the way was ignored until um, Not On Our Watch came out, as you recall, what do we do you know, to basically make sure other, uh, other governments and, uh, are not uh, murdering their victims? Who else is forgotten? Who else should we concentrate on? I mean, <clears throat> unfortunately, as I was saying before, the, the R2P doctrine is a political doctrine. So it's always gonna depend on the political interests of states and it's up to people to make sure that their states understand it's in their interest, to hold governments accountable for their failures to respond. If the, peop if the constituencies don't demand that their governments take action, then the calculation of national interests is, is not gonna take that into account. How are we forgetting this stuff? Today, in 2000? All the time. We're for I mean, it, because it's, it's a, the system that we have is one that is by its nature a political system. I mean, there are legal systems in place as well. I don't want to discount the legal. Certainly, the European human rights system is a very robust regional human rights system. The European Court of Human Rights can render legally binding judgments. The compliance rate is very strong. The American system, not quite as robust, but still pretty good. The African system is still maturing. The African Court is a very young institution, so it, it has a ways to go in that regard. If you're looking at the UN level, there are a few independent expert treaty bodies with very, very limited powers. The power is really in the political bodies. And so 
you necessarily have a system of selective enforcement. We had the same thing with the establishment of tribunals, right? The, the tribunals that we had up until the establishment of the International Criminal Court were called ad hoc tribunals. Nuremberg, Tokyo, Yugoslav Tribunal, Rwanda Tribunal, they're all ad hoc, meaning they were established to deal with a particular situation. A political decision was taken to create the tribunal to deal with a particular situation. And so you could say every time a tribunal is not created, somebody's being forgotten. But again, it's the, the system that we have is one that is necessarily going to be selective because it's based on a calculation of political interests. Uh, and I don't want this to sound political, but is our administration, uh, you know, as you know, the, the uh, previous administration, the Bush administration, was very much opposed to our membership in the you know, United Nations you know, Commission on Civil Rights. Someone once said, by the way, and uh, some pundit basically said that because it was because Bush himself, after invading Iraq, perhaps thought that he might be a war criminal. Who knows? Is there any movement towards a stronger recognition of the role of the United States by, in, uh, in the United Nations? We haven't paid our dues for a long time. And is there any recognition of the importance of United Nations human rights efforts on the part of either this administration or generally on the part of our government. Yeah, there was in the second term of the last administration too. I mean, and maybe you're talking about a couple of different things. One is the International Criminal Court, which the US is not a party to, nor will it be in the foreseeable future. I mean, the Obama administration is equally concerned about restraints on its hand and sort of dealing forcibly with matters around the world. So there's no chance the US is gonna become a party to the International Criminal Court. If you're talking about the UN human rights system, there was already a change between the first and second George W. Bush terms. Uh, the, the US paid a huge political cost because it was basically giving the middle finger to the UN human rights bodies and to the UN generally. And so the game in the UN was whatever the US wants, everybody else is gonna block it. So the Bush administration had already made significant changes in its posture towards the UN human rights system between the first term and the second term. Many of the foreign policy changes have been continued by the Obama administration. One significant change with Obama was the U.S. decided to run for a seat on the U.N. Human Rights Council. So Ob the Obama administration decided to engage with the Human Rights Council, which I think was a very positive step, but to, for complete disclosure, I was a member of the first U.S. delegation to the Human Rights Council, so I have a particular bias, but <laughs> I think that was a very good move, and it was certainly good to engage in a very positive human rights dialogue with the rest of the international community. Thank you so much for the answer to your question, and I just want to make the you know, the point, uh, finally, it's, and this does not end with the question mark, but I still think that we have to maintain continued uh, support and, you know, continued progress, or we slip back. My students, by the way, are very much interested in human rights as opposed to civil rights, because my course deals primarily with the American Constitution. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very interesting, it's the awareness, and the awareness that it comes from publicity, from people speaking for forums such as this. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to maintain that awareness. You know, I think that, you know, typical of any type of professor, I'm gonna say that that's, our that that's the voice of our future. That's what makes the change. The, the uh, current and, and old generations have already made up their minds, and that was towards a uh, apathy. Thank you so much. Let me just add that uh, as chair of the board of an organization called United and Genocide, which is the largest grassroots anti-genocide organization in this country. I couldn't be more sympathetic with the premise of your question. I certainly agree with Dr. Cerrone that, uh, I'm sorry, I can't take the opportunity to disagree with you in this respect. <laughs> I certainly agree that the United States is not gonna be ratifying the International Criminal Court statutes, the Rome statutes, anytime soon. But I do think it's interesting that the Obama administration has found a number of ways to cooperate with the court in terms of providing access to evidence, for example, in terms of not vetoing uh, other actions that, that it could, which uh, I think have been rather clever ways, actually, of supporting the court. And the reality is, how, how does human rights change takes place? In general, it takes place through the creation of what I will call a virtuous circle, in which changes in laws impact changes in norms, and changes in norms impact changes in law. If we look at the civil rights movement in this country, for example, 
we know that the cry of the segregationists was, you can't legislate morality. But we also know that once the changes were made in the civil rights laws, and people were forced by law to revise their social practices, gradually, particularly over a number of generations, the norms began to take hold, mm -hmm. and behavior and hearts followed. You can legislate morality, uh, but you have to be very uh, vigilant about education and uh, experience in that respect. And gradually, I believe that, that these norms will change at the, uh, in the United States with regard to international uh, accountability, uh, judicial accountability. The International Criminal Court just a month ago convicted its first and thus far only, uh, uh, succeeded in, in, in its first and only conviction. It's a, it's a very nascent operation, despite uh, having been uh, uh, in place since 2003, am I right about that? 2002. Uh, so it's a very new body, it's a new experience, but the court is already, as I mentioned briefly, I alluded to its influence uh, in helping to resolve several conflict situations simply by the threat of uh, transfer of cases to the court. I think it's important that the court has indicted uh, Sudanese leaders, even though they have not yet been taken into account. I'll also mention uh, this is not genocide, or, or at least I think it's hard to make a legal case. I defer to Dr. Sran on this, but we're overlooking Congo. We're overlooking uh, what has been going on in Congo uh, for at least the last uh, uh, 10 years. Uh, we may be overlooking what may happen in South Sudan. So there are a, a, a wide variety of places where mass atrocities either are taking place or are threatened uh, or, or uh, may be on the verge of taking place, and we need to shift our attention, keep our attention there. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to take moderator's privilege for a second because you bring up, um, I think, a really important question, which is how will we make sure that this doesn't happen again, or how can we make sure we're not missing people? Um, I think one of the, uh, the new things that's going on right now that we're all sort of experiencing is the birth of new media, mm -hmm. right? Um, you alluded to the, to the Coney trial, the Coney situation, Coney 2012. Um, but, you know, one of the questions I have is, is that participation, that increased participation that you have from Facebook and Twitter and all of these things, is it actually promoting um, more awareness? Is it driving better use of human rights um, standards and norms? You know, sort of what, what is that push and pull between greater participation and the positive impact that has on democracy and the impact that that has on sort of the human rights discussion, which is so fragile, um, and bringing in sort of extra noise, does that complicate um, where we're at or where we're going or the progress that we've made? I believe it's making an enormous difference and will make uh, an even greater difference in the future. You know, e even back in 1994, when I started at Amnesty International, uh, it was still possible to, uh, to have atrocities taking place in the remote corners of the globe without having immediate awareness, much less significant attention and action in that respect. Mm. That has changed completely. We now have uh, live streaming pictures of some of these atrocities taking place. Mm -hmm. Now, it's certainly true that, that uh, as Dr. Sharon said, the political dimensions of whether or not to actually milita uh, militarily intervene in a place like Syria um, are profound and may trump the emotional reactions that we have when we see the pictures of what's happening in Syria. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, it is absolutely the case that there is greater pressure on not just the Syrian government, but in that case, on the Russian government, mm -hmm. and to some uh, what less extent perhaps on the Chinese government, who are the major blocking forces right now, to a resolution of the uh, situation in Syria. So I think it is the greatest ally that the human rights movement has, and uh, will make it impossible for, uh, for these crimes to go undetected in real time. Mm -hmm. And also, I think it, it's important to say with the proliferation of human rights groups that I referred to around the globe, those groups are m often very modest in size. They are, they are often under tremendous threat. This is a tremendous tool that they have to, to some extent, equal the scales with the pow forces of power that they are aligned against. 
Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, I, I generally agree as well. Although I have to say a colleague of mine raised the point about the silo effect. And he was saying that mm -hmm. because of the way these social media work, they tend to entrench views rather than exchange mm -hmm. views. That people sort of have friends and they choose to follow. And so they're essentially surrounding themselves with people with similar views. And there's not much dialogue across these different sort of discrete circles of views. Now. I don't know if that's any more the case than it is in life generally. Sure. No. You know? Well, that may be true. I'm speaking solely in terms of it being used as a vehicle for human rights change. If, it's, if we're talking documentation, exposure, a rallying of, of, uh, of opinion in that respect, simply uh, protection in some respects. I alluded to the satellite imagery that was focused on 10 villages in Darfur that were under threat. Nine of those villages survived without any kind of action from, uh, from uh, the Syrian government and its allies. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was in large part because uh, the government knew that, uh, that if it, uh, if it uh, uh, suborned attacks upon those villages, the entire world would see in real time. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. I, I just want to see for one second, is there, we've talked about a ton of stuff. There have to be a million questions, and I just want to make sure that we're hearing lots of different voices. Can I follow up with Reverend Schultz on the matter of sex selection abortion, which you just told us you're opposed to? <laughs> have you opposed it publicly in writings or in speeches? That's my first question. Uh, sir, I am. Uh, the issue of abortion is not an issue that the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee is involved in. I am, uh, this is not an issue that I am uh, deeply involved in at this point. So I, you so asked me what my opinion was about this matter. I certainly would not support abortion based upon sex selection. And Amnesty International firmly opposed this in the case of China, for example. Amnesty International regularly condemned China for, for uh, the support that it gave to abortions based upon uh, sex. But it doesn't, doesn't concern you apparently too much. It concern, I was the head of Amnesty International. And you don't denounce it publicly it. or I spoke writing. out against it constantly. Go back and read the record. I Just know you like to play the race card when it comes to capital punishment. You've done this before in many aspects of capital punishment. Do you acknowledge that when it comes to murder in this country, Blacks murder whites about three times more frequently than whites murder that, blacks. That's that number one. And finally, with respect to capital punishment itself, do you admit something that's been hard to get you to admit in the past, that since Gilmore's execution in 77, 56% of all those executed have been white, even though they're committing less than half of the murders, and about 35% of all those executed have been black, even though they're committing about half of the murders, a disproportionate result. Does this bother you? I know that it would bother you if the numbers were reversed, wouldn't it? I am opposed to capital punishment in any context for any person, period. I'm, uh, if there aren't any other questions, uh, please. Say, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Um, First and foremost, I would like to thank you for your opinions. Uh, I know I showed up a little bit late, but you know I caught a little bit of um, of everything that was said. Um, but more importantly, I, I wanted to um, to ask. You touched upon the Coney 2012 campaign movement. Now, the difference between what I've seen um, with you know with the new globalized format of of approaching campaigns and everything else, you know, with the with the onset of the internet and how you can spread this information quickly, it shows that we, we have short attention spans for campaigns. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you had like in the sixties, you know, I know I was not born at that time, but uh, following up on that time, I've always, uh, I noticed that if you had a campaign, it would take a long time for that campaign to, to actually come to, to fruition or to instill the change that it's actually trying to, to address. But nowadays, we have like a short attention span. Sure, it would spread. The wide, like the, the injection of the information that it's supposed to give is given, you know, quickly and effectively and it spreads very fast. But after, you know, maybe a week or two, it's all forgotten. And my question to you is how can we effectively try to manage 
you know, these campaigns, you know, even from a student perspective? Um, how can we try to effectively manage this and, and try to, to maybe extend that time period that the campaign is supposed to be held? Because it's becoming a problem. You had the Haiti earthquake, you know, which people, you know, as soon as it happened, everybody was all about it. You know, the, the, um, the in Indonesian um, tsunami that happened, you know, uh, uh, you know, a few years ago, when it happened, it didn't last that long in terms of the response. So how can we address these things and, and sort of have, you know, a transparency format where you could keep track of these things and try to, you know, get back to the people themselves who are very important in spreading this information to make a change? Because in a state of human rights, I think it's very important to, to address these issues and to keep following up on people who say they're going to do certain things and hold them, you know, responsible for their actions uh, otherwise. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I certainly agree with that. This is the important, uh, importance of institutions. Uh, this is why our responses, which often come immediately from our, from our hearts or emotions, need to be institutionalized. And uh, the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, for example, is still in Haiti long after other organizations and governments have uh, exited Haiti because we believe that that kind of long-term building of new structures and support of new economic opportunities uh, in Haiti, of uh, retimbering the central plateau, is absolutely essential to a, a long-term response in that, uh, in that uh, troubled country. So I, I couldn't agree with you more, but that's why it's important for all of us to support institutions and organizations that try to maintain a long-term focus beyond the immediate reaction that you've described. Um, actually, to comment on that, part of the new media is that it is so quick and that it is so fast and it's on to the next thing, on to the next thing. And that's where institutions need to learn how to utilize them to keep that interest going and to keep the interest focused on them because if you don't, you just get lost in the noise. But that's actually not my question. I just love <laughs> social media. I'm a marketing major, but that's all we learn about right now. Um, my question is, I actually haven't heard you guys talk about the UN's 2015 goals at all, and I would really love to hear what you guys kind of have to say. I think that it's very soon when they announced that. It seemed like a very short time span, and I wasn't sure if it was realistic, but I would just love to hear your guys' opinions on that. Sure. Yeah, certainly progress has been uneven across mm -hmm. the globe. Um, there have been some progress that some of the targets have already been met in some places, but uh, a lot of places are not anywhere near on track to, to meeting those goals. Um, and from a U.S. perspective, it's, it's interesting to talk about that in, in a discussion about human rights, because, you know, Bill, of course, was saying he does a lot of work on economic and social rights issues, but as far as the U.S. government is concerned, there's no such thing as economic and social rights, at least not as human rights or not as legal rights. The, the U.S. has traditionally held this position that human rights are first and foremost restraints on government to protect individuals from overreach by government, by abuses from government, so it's sort of a a negative conception of rights where the state has an obligation to refrain from interfering in people's rights. And of course the MDGs are about positive obligations to take steps to um, you know, deal with poverty and malnutrition and access to water. And so from the US perspective, it's not really in a human rights framework, it's in a development framework. And so that has a different uh, normative uh, impact. No, I, uh, well said. <laughs> I want to hear from you guys. <laughs> well, actually, I just really wanted to make a comment. I'm from uh, West Africa, Ivory Coast. Uh, I think very often when we are in the United States, it's very easy for us to speak. But actually, there's a lot of progress being made, you know, with uh, human rights. Uh, the establishment of the International Criminal Court alone is really giving cause to all those, you know, African president or some of the leaders that to think before they act. So I just really wanted to, to make sure I, I just really noticed that. And the other thing I'd like to say too, to Dr. Schultz is, uh, uh, you know, given what I see, I'm wondering if you need a you know, some type of police protections or bodyguard <laughs> when you go to speak. <laughs>
You'll be my bodyguard, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, let me just say with regard to Cote d'Ivoire, I think it's a very interesting situation because uh, the transfer of President uh, Gabo, am I pronouncing it correctly, Michael? Uh, the transfer of uh, former President Gabo to the court uh, in a manner that did not do him harm is a very interesting development because we know historically that those who uh, either lose elections or are tossed out of office have often met unfortunate fates. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that this decision by the current government in Cote d'Ivoire, and believe me, I know there are lots and lots of reasons to criticize that government, but the decision to allow the transfer of Gabo to the jurisdiction of the court was a very, very important uh, decision that, that, that was made and provides, uh, again, the creation of new norms uh, at the international level for how you handle these time, types of disputes. And if I can just add the role of the International Criminal Court with respect to Africa is also a context in which you can see a real change in uh, U.S. government policy, again, between the first and second Bush terms. Because the first Bush term, very anti-ICC, ideological opposition, which isn't the traditional U.S. approach to international courts. The U.S. has always been very pragmatic. Courts can be useful foreign policy tools in some circumstances. You should use them when they're useful. But the Bush administration initially was ideologically opposed to the idea of a court. So they said basically these things are never useful. They're bad ideas. And so they would, whip, they would try to whip up opposition to the court in Africa by saying this court is a colonial institution. Mm -hmm. It's a bunch of white people sitting in The Hague judging Africans. And unfortunately, I mean, all of the situations before the court have been from Africa. And so it was sort of feeding into this rhetoric of the Bush administration that this is a colonial institution. And also, even just sort of the composition of the bench, um, there, it was very heavily European. Um, it, even the, the Latin American judges all had last names like Blackman and Steiner, and they were all very white. And so it was kind of feeding into this, again, this uh, perception, or, or what Bush was trying to say was this European colonial institution. Then there was the Darfur referral, at which the U.S. abstained. Even though the U.S. was saying genocide in Darfur, we've got to do something about this, and the rest of the world said, okay, refer the situation to the International Criminal Court, and the Bush administration said, no, we didn't mean that, actually. We meant, let's do something else. Uh, in any event, the U.S. lost that diplomatic struggle, and the resolution went through, and the U.S. abstained. It, it couldn't pay the political cost of using its veto to block that referral. After that happened, the U.S. began to see the value of the ICC, specifically in the Darfur context. So the U.S. began to, to return to its traditional pragmatic approach that, ooh, it's really useful to have this ICC prosecuting al-Bashir. And then, when African Union countries all started pressuring the Security Council to stop the prosecutor, because the Security Council has the power to stop a prosecution, at least temporarily, and African Union leaders were all lobbying the Security Council permanent members, you've got to stop this prosecution. We don't want the ICC going after heads of state. This is ridiculous. There was only one Security Council member that refused to cave, and ironically, it was the United States under Bush. So the U.S., under the second term of the Bush administration, refused to cave to the AU leaders who were all saying we have to stop this prosecution. So ironically, the U.S. became a, su a strong supporter of the court. So I, I, was, um, I was particularly taken by your comment, um, uh, Bill, uh, which was about the environment. And I think so often we think about environmental activism and human rights being a you know, people versus planet. Um, but, uh, you know, from my own work, um, also, you see, and you think about, we talked about Haiti, but um, you think about Katrina and we talked about Indonesia, when you think about Katrina, that is a beautiful example of the sort of confluence of disaster, people, planet, everything all coming together and poverty and your economic social rights. So I was taken by the fact that you're bringing together um, advocates of planet and the importance of people, because at the end of the day, human rights brings people into the picture. 
right? So um, I'm curious if you could say more about that or if, and also I would love to hear from, uh, from John about whether or not there are legal um, sort of mechanisms to make that sort of, that stick, that connection stick. I think, as I said, that this is one of, going to be one of the most pressing elements of a new human rights uh, regime and uh, recognition that, that these are intimately intertwined. We know, of course, that environmental advocates have long themselves, in some context, been under threat and that their own human rights have been mm -hmm. uh, in danger in, the, right. in uh, the Amazon, for example. Absolutely. Uh, but what we're seeing now is whole societies and whole countries or large regions of countries put in jeopardy mm -hmm. uh, because of environmental change and the result naturally is that when resources become scarcer people are tend to to come into conflict with one another right. and when they come into conflict with one another human rights violations often mm -hmm. take place so uh, I think that, it, that we came late to this recognition but I think that the Rwandan genocide is a beautiful example of this mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, this is not to say, it is not to go with uh, uh, someone like Jared Diamond who believes that environmental change inevitably leads or is fated in some way to lead to destruction, but uh, I think that we do need to recognize these intimate connections and that the two movements need to be far more closely aligned with one another than they have been. Yeah, no, I agree, and I think disaster often is the place you know Absolutely. where that comes, the Absolutely. conflict that comes from disaster, yes. the vulnerability that comes from disaster, so. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, no, I would agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, the Haiti situation was uh, a difficult one, of course, and the, the Human Rights Council convened a special session, but there was, you know, some Western countries were saying, you know, why is the Human Rights Council getting involved? Okay, it's a human rights issue, but what are we gonna say? Every human right is being violated then what, right? So, so then there's this question of, is the human rights framework a helpful framework in which to place yeah. things, yeah. right? And there was a dispute about whether or not it was actually helpful to have a human rights council session where they go through and they just say, okay, all of these rights are being violated. We need to pour a whole bunch of money into this country and you know, redevelop an infrastructure and an educational system and a healthcare system and a justice system. Mm -hmm. So you know, again, the, the sort of the jury's out on whether or not it's helpful to apply a human rights framework in a situation like that. I just wanted to, for you all to comment a little bit about in the last decade or so we've seen of course more uh, corporations uh, controlling, you know, becoming multinational and um, just want to talk a little, hoping you'd address a little bit uh, the intersection of that cor corporations becoming so powerful internationally and uh, how that intersects with human rights and uh, well, maybe John wants to start here because uh, the United Nations and Professor John Ruggie at Harvard have done some important work in this area of the intersection of business and, and human rights. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk sure. a little bit about it's, it's a tricky issue because corporations as such are not subjects of international law. So right now, we can't say legally that corporations have any obligations under international law. The, the predecessor to the Human Rights Council, the Human Rights Commission, had a subsidiary body called the Subcommission, a bunch of human rights experts, and they essentially elaborated norms on the human rights responsibilities cor of corporations, and those norms sounded like legal obligations. Well, their report went up to the Commission, and the Commission slammed it and said, mm -hmm. there is no such thing as human rights obligations binding on corporations, does not exist. Human rights obligations bind states, they do not bind corporate entities. So state practice made very clear that human rights norms do not bind corporations as such. But there have been some interesting developments, under, and, and certainly the Ruggie principles have taken off because those principles make clear that these are not legal obligations binding on corporations. There are human rights legal obligations binding on states, states of nationality of the corporation, where the corporation is incorporated, the territorial state where the state where the corporation is operating. Mm -hmm. So it talks about human rights obligations, but makes clear these obligations bind the relevant states. They don't directly bind the corporate entity. But there have been some developments 
under U.S. law, there's this 200-year-old, uh, more than 200-year-old statute called the Alien Tort Statute or the Alien Tort Claims Act, which allows foreigners, aliens, to bring civil cases in U.S. federal courts for violations of international law. And a recent development in the ATCA jurisprudence has been this question of corporate liability. And in fact, this term, the Supreme Court is deciding a major case on whether or not corporations can be held civilly liable under federal law for violations of international law. And one of the major questions is, if corporations are not themselves responsible under international law, to what extent can responsibility arise under federal common law, under US law? So you would take a prohibitory norm from international law, which strictly speaking just binds the state, but find a new form of responsibility under US law that's sort of grafted on to this prohibition of international law. So it's an exciting time, and we'll know once the judgment comes down later this year which way the Supreme Court has decided, whether in favor of corporate liability or against. But quite apart from these issues, I think more and more corporations are recognizing that their own interests, their own business interests, are implicated uh, by supporting human rights, in, or, or certainly by not being perceived as violators of human rights. Now, we know, of course, the historic examples of uh, uh, various uh, retail chains that have been subject to uh, pressure uh, because of their use of child labor or uh, other various forms of labor violations. Uh, but it is also a question of such simple things as ability to enforce contracts. If you have uh, a, a corporation operating in a country that doesn't recognize the rule of law, then its own uh, economic interests are put in jeopardy because of its uh, inability to enforce contracts. Having said all this, I think it's still enormously imp important that, that citizens, that shareholders, continue to monitor corporate behavior, keep, hold corporations to account, uh, because of some of the limitations legally that Professor Cerrone has referenced, uh, this kind of consumer action is enormously important. We at the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee are involved, for example, right now uh, in efforts to uh, uh, to identify some of those corporations whose practice with regard to the treatment of their employees uh, is, uh, is less than uh, ideal. And uh, it is this kind of action that I think ultimately persuades corporations. Uh, corporations often change far more quickly than governments do. Uh, often uh, persuades corporations uh, that their interests are served when they are uh, aligned with those of the human rights regimen. That's right, I have a question. <laughs> I have questions too. Um, first is a comment, you have about 10 minutes left. But the second is a question. Uh, Secretary Clinton said that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender rights are human rights. Is that true? Also, if it is true, what are the implications of holding other countries accountable for that? Or really holding our own country accountable for that? Yeah, if you're asking the legal question, no, it's not true, unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, at least as far as international law goes. Uh, there are some interpretations of the covenant on civil and political rights that, that would imply some degree of protection from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, but those interpretations have been sort of dicta uh, in the work of the committee, not uh, legally binding on the case before. Well, in any event, the committees don't have the power to legally bind. But if you just look at state practice, it's fairly clear that there is no rule of international law prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. There have been some good developments. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, it would have been unthinkable to have even a political resolution adopted on the issue of sexual orientation in a UN body. We're increasingly seeing that. But when you have a, a large number of states around the world that still criminalize uh, homosexual conduct, it's very difficult to argue that there's a norm of international law prohibiting that. I mean, to have a rule of customary law evolve, you have to have a fairly consistent practice among states, and you also have something called the opinio juris, an acceptance that that practice is legally compulsory. So once you have a critical mass of states all abolishing their sodomy laws and saying we, we're abolishing these sodomy laws because we feel legally bound to abolish them, then we can talk about having 
a customary norm prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. But even if you look just, uh, was it two years ago in the General Assembly, they were running an annual resolution on um, condemning summary execution. It's the General Assembly, it's not, its resolutions are not legally binding, it's just a political statement condemning summary execution. And there's one paragraph, one operative paragraph that condemns summary execution on discriminatory grounds, including race, religion, nationality, sex, and they included sexual orientation. Well, the General Assembly voted to amend the provision to delete the phrase sexual orientation. And this is not just, it's not something like gay marriage or workplace discrimination. It was just condemning murdering people, <laughs> right, for their sexual orientation. And the General Assembly felt the need to delete the reference to sexual orientation, which was astonishing. One of the countries that voted to delete the reference to sexual orientation was South Africa. <laughs> and of course, sexual orientation is uh, protected in the South African Constitution, and there's a very strong civil society in South Africa, which went ballistic in response to the Saf South African vote at the United Nations. As a result, the, there was another vote to amend the resolution to insert sexual orientation back into the resolution, but just to show the strong division of opinion that still remains on this issue in the international community. This is a perfect example of, of what I was describing earlier, of the way in which changes in norms eventually impact changes in laws, and changes in laws then move norms ahead. And certainly it's true that from a legal point of view, with the exception of something like 17 states, most of them in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, that, that do recognize uh, uh, gay, gay and lesbian rights, uh, that, the, that the, 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 this is... Uh, certainly not uh, a legal norm in many, many places yet. But the truth is that, that the uh, normative nature of this issue is in tremendous flux. Mm -hmm. It may well be that the Supreme Court uh, in this country uh, does not uh, rule uh, in the uh, California case that is gradually working its way up, uh, does not rule uh, in favor of uh, gay and lesbian rights, uh, marriage equality. Uh, because the norms have perhaps not yet evolved sufficiently, at least as those norms are reflected in the number of states that affirm marriage equality. So it may well be that the legal case is a little bit too far ahead of the norms change in that particular case. But I think it's inevitable that those norms will change and the laws will change, uh, uh, and the only question is how long. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Since we have a couple minutes, if there are any, um, if there are any issues that the two of you think should be on, given this is a captive audience, <laughs> what, this is a captive audience that's interested in the state of human rights mm. and believes that you're experts. <laughs> So what what sh what should people be paying attention to? What you know? What what's one of the um, key topics uh, in one of your forthcoming books? What what are, what are what what are the new issues so that these guys can walk away and and be on the on the cutting edge? The U.S. should ratify the Women's Convention. It's not cutting edge, unfortunately. It was adopted in 1979, and it's, the U.S. still has not ratified this treaty that's been ratified by 187 countries. Um, and the U.S. is largely in compliance with it, and the, there, there are a few U.S. concerns, but they're, they're really misplaced, like the concern that the convention might require the U.S. to put women in all military combat positions, which is certainly a position that the committee has never taken. Um, and in any event, the U.S. basically does put women in all combat almost all combat positions now out of necessity. It's had to. It needs the bodies. Um, so there's, so, so there's really no good reason for the U.S. not to be a party to the treaty at this point in time. So what difference will it make? It'll be very important as an advocacy tool for women's groups within the United States, but also externally. The U.S. will have a, a, a better political position to lobby for women's rights protections in other countries is if the U.S. says, yes, we're a party to this treaty as well. We abide by this treaty. The U.S. will also be able to nominate an expert to sit on the CEDAW committee. So I think it would be a very good thing for the U.S., both politically, legally, it would be good for women's groups in the U.S., and it would be good for women around the world. 
-hmm. And while it's at it, we might ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which mm -hmm. is uh, a convention mm -hmm. that all countries except Somalia and the United States have ratified. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I would, in answer to your mm -hmm. question, uh, I would say that uh, I think that the evolving recognition of social and economic rights, mm -hmm. not legal recognition, I understand, but uh, recognition of uh, s uh, a, a new, what at least in this country is perceived as a, a new category of rights, uh, is, uh, is evolving in, in a very significant way. Mm -hmm. You know, the truth is that we do recognize in this country the right to education. We provide that mm -hmm. every child ought to have access to at least a minimal level of public education. That is a social right. It's not a civil and political right. It is a social right. In the 2008 presidential debate, uh, candidate Obama and candidate, Mc, uh, uh, what was his name, McCain, mm -hmm. were at, how quickly we forget, were asked whether health care was a right or a responsibility. And President Obama, citing the experience of his own mother, mm -hmm. called it a right in that debate. Now that was a radical statement, whether people knew it or not, and certainly he has retreated from that. He retreated from that language in trying to pass yep. his health care legislation, yep. but he did call it a right, yep. and I think more and more people are recognizing that that is the case. Yep. How about a round of applause for our two speakers and our moderator? Thank you for this great conversation. Thank you all for participating. If you haven't become a member of the forum, check out our info booth in the back. Thanks a lot. Have a good night. <laughs>